welcome back. Uh, this lecture is a continuation of last lecture wherein we introduced vapor compression refrigeration systems and we discussed saturated single stage standard uh, cycle that is SSS uh, cycle and we compared the performance of that cycle with an ideal uh, Kano vapor compression refrigeration system. And we have also given some uh, basic equations for evaluating the performance of this system. So we will uh, continue in this lecture uh, uh, starting with the performance aspects of uh, SSS cycle and we will also discuss uh, the various modifications to the standard cycle. So the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to discuss the performance of SSS cycle, introduce subcooling and superheating, discuss vapor compression refrigeration system with liquid suction heat exchanger discuss effect of superheat on system performance, discuss the differences between theoretical and actual cycles and uh, discuss a complete vapor compression refrigeration system. So at the end of this lesson, uh, you should be able to evaluate the effects of evaporator and condensing temperatures on the performance of a SSS cycle, evaluate the effects of subcooling and superheating using TS and PS diagrams evaluate the performance of modified vapor compression refrigeration system with liquid suction heat exchanger and find whether superheating increases COP or not using a simple criteria and discuss various irreversibilities in actual systems and their impact on performance. So let us begin with the uh, performance of SSS cycle. Uh, the performance can be obtained from the simple analysis presented in the last lecture and using suitable property data. And typical performance trend show the effects of evaporator and condenser temperatures. What is normally done is we keep the condenser temperature constant and vary the evaporator temperature and find different performance parameters. Uh, then uh, you keep the evaporator temperature constant and vary the condenser temperature. So the, in that manner you can find out the effect of both condenser as well as evaporator temperature on different performance parameters of interest. Okay, let me show now uh, the effect of these temperatures on different uh, performance parameters. The first one is uh, the effect of these temperatures on specific and volumic refrigeration effects and then specific and volumic works of compression, then system COP. So first let me show the effect of uh, the temperature on uh, refrigeration effect. So this QE is a specific refrigeration effect as you can see it has unit of kilojoule per kg and uh, QV is volumetric uh, volumic refrigeration effect that means uh, refrigeration effect per meter cube of um, uh, refrigerant flow. And you can see here that uh, on X axis I have evaporator temperature and I have got these performance parameters for different values of condenser temperature. So you can see that condenser temperature is increasing in this direction for uh, specific refrigeration effect and it is increasing again in the same direction for volumic uh, refrigeration effect. So from this uh, graph you can easily see that uh, as you are increasing the evaporator temperature for a given condenser temperature there is a marginal increase in specific refrigeration effect. Okay. And the specific refrigeration effect also uh, increases as condensing temperature decreases. Okay. That means uh, QE uh, increases as Te increases and Tc decreases. But as I said this effect is not very, um, uh, very large, it is marginal that you can easily find out from this uh, PH diagram. As, uh, as I have already discussed in the last class, this is your refrigeration effect or this is your QE. Okay. So if you are keeping the condenser temperature constant and if you are varying the evaporator temperature, for example I am increasing the evaporator temperature, that means this line shifts up okay. so, and you have the a new cycle like this. So what is the increase in uh, refrigeration effect is very, very small. You can see that that is only this much. Okay. So this purely depends upon the slope of this saturated vapor curve on pH uh, diagram okay. and you can see that it is almost vertical. So the change in QE with T is marginal. And what happens when you are uh, reducing Tc? You can see that for example when I am reducing the Tc, you have uh, reduced Tc like this. So your refrigeration effect now increases and it becomes larger. Okay. So that you can very easily verify with the help of this uh, pH diagram. Okay. And uh, you can also see the effect of these temperatures on volumic refrigeration effect. So how did we define volumic refrigeration effect? If you remember QV is defined as H1 minus H4 divided by the specific volume of the refrigerant vapor at the inlet to the compressor. That means specific volume at the 
at this particular point. Okay. Now you can see that for a given condensing temperature as you are increasing evaporator temperature, uh, specific uh, vo volumic refrigeration effect increases very rapidly. You can see that by this dashed line. Why does it increase rapidly? Because you can see that there are two effects here. First effect is uh, this. Okay. As T increases, specific refrigeration effect increases marginally. So, numerator increases. Okay. At the same time, when you are increasing the evaporator temperature, the specific volume of the refrigerant vapor decreases uh, steeply. Okay. So, numerator is increasing and denominator is reducing steeply. As a result, you can see that uh, the volumic refrigeration effect increases uh, quite rapidly with evaporator temperature and it reduces uh, as the condenser temperature is reduced. So, what is the uh, practical consequence of this? The practical consequence of this is if you are operating your system at high evaporator temperature, your volumic refrigeration effect is very large. That means, uh, the required size of the compressor will be small because remember that in the last class I have mentioned that this is an indication of the size of the system for a given refrigeration capacity. Okay. So, higher the evaporator temperature, smaller will be the size of the system. Conversely, when the evaporator temperature is very small, you end up with a very large and bulky compressor. Now, let us see the effect of these temperatures on other performance parameters. So, this uh, graph here shows the effect of uh, evaporator and condenser temperatures on specific work of compression, okay. that is work of compression um, uh, per kg of refrigerant and this is volumic work of compression. Again, we have defined this in the last class. Okay. Um, uh, if you multiply the specific work of compression into mass flow rate, you get the power and if you multiply the volumic work of compression into volumetric flow rate, you get the power. Okay. And you can see that for a given condenser temperature, for example, take this condenser temperature, as you are increasing T, uh, okay, so as you are uh, increasing T, your work of uh, compression, specific work of compression reduces in this direction. That means, specific work of compression reduces as T increases. Why does it happen? Again, you can easily verify this with the help of your pH diagram. Let us say that this is your original pH diagram and this is your work of compression. Okay, now, if I am increasing uh, this uh, uh, evaporator temperature, then you can see that this is this will get reduced. Okay, that you can verify even from the earlier diagram also. So, okay, so it has a quite uh, a significant effect. So, as your uh, evaporator temperature increases, work of compression reduces and uh, the work of compression reduces as your T C reduces. Okay. Now, how about the uh, effect of this on volumic work of compression? Volumic work of compression is again defined as, uh, if you look at the earlier pH diagram, it is simply defined as H2 minus H1 divided by V1. And here you have seen that as you are increasing T, this is reducing. Okay. And at the same time, this also reduces. So, both numerator as well as denominator reduces. So, ultimately, whether this reduces or not depend, depends upon the relative uh, reduction in this over this. Okay. So, you can see that initially, as evaporator temperature is increasing, the volumic work of compression increases. So, it reaches some peak, then it starts reducing. Okay. The same thing is observed for uh, different condenser temperatures, and you can see that this peak shifts to higher evaporator temperatures uh, as the condenser temperature is increased. Okay, so, this is the effect of uh, evaporator and condenser temperatures on work of compression. Now, let us see the effect of this on COP of the system. Okay, so, you can see the effect of uh, evaporator and condenser temperature on COP of the system. So, from the earlier two um, uh, figures, it is very easy to come to this conclusion because as you know very well, COP is the, COP is the ratio of your refrigeration effect divided by work of compression. So, we have seen that as T is increasing, refrigeration effect increases very marginally, but this reduces uh, significantly. As a result, your COP increases with COP increases with uh, T. Okay. And similarly, uh, when uh, T C is increasing, this reduces, that means Q E reduces as T C increases and work of compression increases as T C increases. So, as a result, COP reduces as your uh, condenser temperature increases. 
Okay. So, one thing you can uh, notice here just like your uh, effect of uh, performance on Carnot system, you can see that at lower condenser temperatures the effect of uh, evaporator is quite predominant. That means, this curve is quite steep compared to other curves. Okay. So, that means, at lower uh, condenser temperature, evaporator temperature has a um, uh, larger effect. And at lower evaporator temperature, the effect of condenser temperature is marginal. Okay. So, what do we conclude from this? We conclude from this that uh, if you want to have a good uh, COP and if you want to have a small um, compressor um, and small uh, refrigerant flow rate etcetera, you have to operate your system at as high an evaporator temperature as possible and as low a condensing temperature as possible. Unfortunately, the evaporator and condensing temperatures, uh, it is not in the hands of the designer completely because they are actually decided by the customer. For example, the evaporator temperature depends upon your storage requirements or your refrigeration requirements and the condenser temperature generally depends upon the available heat sink. Okay. So, you really do not have much say on this, but still you can reduce, uh, for example, you can reduce the temperature differences between the heat source and sink and the refrigerant temperatures by designing efficient heat exchangers, only that is the advantage you get. Okay. And one thing you can notice here as I have already mentioned is that the trends here are exactly similar to that of a Kano cycle. Okay. The, for example, the effect of T and T C on uh, COP, um, uh, it is the uh, qualitatively it is same for the Kano cycle as well as the standard uh, SSS cycle. Okay. So, you can uh, this is the conclusions uh, from the performance trends. For good system performance, the evaporator temperature should be high and condensing temperature should be low. At low evaporator temperature, effect of condenser temperature is marginal. The above trends are similar to that of a Kano refrigeration system. At very low evaporator temperatures, single saturated uh, single stage cycle is not viable because the COPs will be small and required compressor size will be very large. Okay, so, in such cases we have to use what is known as a multi-stage or cascade system. Okay, we will discuss the multi-stage and cascade systems in the next class. Okay, now, let us look at modifications to uh, so standard uh, saturated single stage cycle. What are the modifications? First modification is subcooling. So, let us look at uh, subcooling. What do we mean by subcooling? In actual systems, the temperature of the heat sink will be several degrees lower than the condensing temperature for heat transfer. That means, if you have an actual vapor compression system and let us say that your uh, 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 heat sink is available at 30 degrees, then to facilitate heat transfer, you have to operate your condenser at a temperature higher than 30 degree centigrade. Okay. It may be 31, 32, 33. Right? So, whatever it is, there will be some delta T or some temperature difference between the refrigerant condensing inside the condenser and the external heat sink. Okay. So, some delta T is available. So, you, it is possible to cool the exit of the condenser to temperatures lower than the condensing temperature by adding some extra area. Okay. For example, you have a delta T of 5 degree centigrade, let us say. So, if your condenser is operating at 35 degrees and the heat sink is 30 degrees, then if you add some more extra, extra area, maybe you can reduce the condenser temperature to 34 or 33. Okay. At the same time, pressure remains constant. Okay. So, by this process, what we are doing? We are actually pushing the uh, refrigerant liquid into subcooled region. Right. If you are not uh, using this, then it will be on the saturated liquid line and if you are adding extra area, it will go into the subcooled region. Okay. This process is known as uh, subcooling. So, as I said, it is possible to cool the refrigerant liquid to a few degrees lower than the condensing temperature. Then the exit condition of the condenser will be in the subcooled liquid region and this process is known as subcooling. As the name implies, uh, it is very clear. And subcooling we shall see has beneficial uh, effects on system performance. Let us look at what are the effects of subcooling on system performance. Okay. So, here uh, what we have here is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, cycle 1, 2, 3, 4 is without subcooling. That means 1, 1, 2, 3 and 4. This is uh, without subcooling. So, you can see that uh, the exit condition of the condenser lies on the saturated liquid line. Okay. So, in this cycle, we have seen in the last class that there are some throttling losses okay. and those throttling losses are given by this area 3, 4, F. Okay. That means, throttling losses without subcooling. 
that is equal to area 3 4 f ok and the same thing is shown on the pH diagram also for example in the pH diagram 1 2 3 4 is the uh, cycle without subcooling and 1 2 3 dash 4 dash is with subcooling ok that means what is happening during subcooling if you are assuming that uh, the saturated liquid line coincides with the constant pressure line that means this constant pressure line is going along the saturated liquid line like we have discussed in the last class then during subcooling what happens is the pressure remains constant but temperature reduces so you can see that the exit condition uh, instead of um, at point 0.3 it will be at point 0.3 dash ok and the temperature at point 0.3 dash will be less than the corresponding saturation temperature T3 ok and this temperature difference T3 minus T3 dash is what is known as the degree of subcooling or delta T sub ok and uh, what has happened because of the subcooling you can see that because of the subcooling the throttling losses have reduced ok previously the throttling loss was area 3 4 f now the throttling loss is 3 4 dash f ok with subcooling this is the throttling loss without subcooling this entire area of the throttling loss ok obviously it will have beneficial effect that will be very clear if you look at the pH diagram ok from the pH diagram without subcooling this is the refrigeration effect that is H1 minus H4 is the refrigeration effect QE without subcooling. And what is the refrigeration effect with subcooling? That is H1 minus H4 dash is QE with subcooling. Okay, so you can see that um, it is good because the refrigeration effect increases means for the same capacity, required mass flow rate reduces, and you have all other uh, uh, related benefits. Okay, so subcooling is uh, really beneficial from this point of view. It, uh, it also has other benefits. Let us look at what are the other benefits. Other benefits are you can see that the exit condition of the condenser is very much in the subcooled liquid region. So, this will always ensure that only liquid goes into the expansion device. Remember that uh, process 3, 4 is the expansion process or throttling process. Okay. So, when you have uh, when you do not have any subcooling then the inlet condition is just saturated liquid. If something uh, if some uh, change takes place in the condenser then there is a possibility that this point will shift this side and the inlet condition will go into two phase. So, at the uh, inlet to the expansion device you may have vapor ok it may be somewhere here. We shall see later that this will actually lead to the malfunctioning of the expansion device. An expansion device is designed to operate with liquid entry only, it should not have any vapor. Okay. So, the possibility of uh, vapor uh, going into the expansion device exists if you have a cycle without subcooling. But whereas, if you have a subcooling then you can see that there is sufficient margin. Okay. So, even if there is some small slight change in the condenser heat transfer still the inlet condition can be in the subcooled region. Okay. So, this is the second benefit. So, subcooling is uh, desirable from this point of view also because it ensures a good uh, and uh, proper operation of uh, expansion device. The third uh, benefit is that uh, if you remember uh, from your uh, last lecture uh, uh, at the exit of the evaporator exit of the expansion device which is nothing but the inlet to the evaporator you have some vapor plus liquid ok and that vapor fraction is uh, given by x4 ok. So, larger this length higher is the amount of vapor ok. So, when you are subcooling the cycle you can see that the vapor fraction has reduced ok from 4 to 4 dash right because x4 dash is less than x4 ok. This is also beneficial it, it also has practical benefits because uh, we shall see again later when we discuss evaporators and all the vapor at the inlet to the evaporator practically does nothing. Uh, that means, it, it does not take part in uh, providing useful refrigeration effect as long as phase change is going on, but it has a negative effect because it inc increases the pressure drop through the evaporator ok. So, normally the smaller the uh, amount of vapor it is better for the evaporator ok. If you do not have any subcooling you see that uh, the fraction of vapor is large and by subcooling you are reducing the fraction of the vapor at the inlet to the evaporator which will reduce the pressure drop in the evaporator and ultimately it will result in better performance ok. So, subcooling has these three benefits so it is uh, very much desirable. So, let us summarize uh, this. 
So, subcooling increases refrigeration effect without affecting work of compression. Yeah, I forgot to mention this. You might have seen that because of subcooling, there is practically no change on the compression side. That means the work of compression remains the same whether you subcool the refrigerant or do not subcool the refrigerant. That means you are getting the benefit of additional refrigeration effect without affecting the work of compression. Obviously, this must give rise to higher volumic refrigeration effect and also higher COP okay, without any extra cost. So, it increases refrigeration effect without affecting work of compression. It reduces the vapor fraction at the inlet to the evaporator leading to reduced pressure drops in the evaporator. It ensures liquid entry into expansion device thereby ensuring its proper function. Okay, so, these are all desirable then why not have large amount of uh, subcooling ultimately unfortunately you, there are certain constraints. What are the constraints? The degree of subcooling depends on the extra area provided for heat transfer and the temperature of the heat sink. So, if you are uh, trying to provide subcooling by increasing the area of heat transfer obviously you are incurring additional cost because the heat, uh, heat exchanger becomes bigger so additional cost. Okay. At the same time uh, it is also limited by the temperature of the heat sink as I have mentioned already the exit temperature of the condenser cannot be lower than the heat sink temperature. Okay. So, that ultimately the degree of subcooling that you can get by this method depends upon the extra area you are uh, you can effort to uh, provide and the heat sink temperature. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, the other modification that is called a superheating. What is superheating? So, temperature of heat source will be few degrees higher than the evaporated temperature. Hence, the vapor at the exit of the evaporator can be superheated. This is again similar to your condenser problem. If you want to exchange heat from the refrigerated space to the evaporator, you must provide certain delta T. Okay. A typical example, for example, if you want to maintain your freezer compartment of a domestic refrigerator, let us say at minus 18 degree centigrade, then you have normally they operate the evaporator at about minus 23 degree centigrade. That means about 5 degrees of temperature difference is provided so that heat transfer can take place in a finite area. Okay. So, some uh, delta T exists. So, if you are uh, if you can effort to you can add uh, more area and you can reduce the delta T keeping the pressure constant. Okay. Thereby what you are doing you are um, uh, adding uh, extra area for heat transfer there will be higher heat transfer to the refrigerant thereby the exit condition of the refrigerant vapor goes into the superheated region. Okay. So, just like you are subcooled uh, this thing this will go into the superheated region. So, this is what you known as the superheating. Okay. Now, superheating can be unlike subcooling, superheating can be useful or useless. What do you mean by useful superheating? If the superheating of refrigerant takes place due to heat transfer with the refrigerated space, then it is called as useful superheating. Okay. That means, if this heat transfer is taking place inside the freezer compartment, okay, then it is useful because the cooling effect is ultimately given to the products. Okay. So, it is you call it as useful superheating. Other on the other hand, if the heat transfer is taking place outside the refrigerated compartment, let us say that it is exchanging heat with surrounding air, okay, then you do not get any benefit, right. So, the refrigerant gets superheated, but you are not getting any benefit, okay. This kind of a superheat is known as useless superheating, okay. So, as I said, on the other hand, if refrigerant vapor becomes superheated by exchanging heat with the surroundings, it is called as useless superheating. Let us look at the effect of useful superheating. For the, uh, let me uh, tell at this point, and I'll also show this later. But useless superheating is detrimental to system performance. Okay, so as far as possible, a system should be designed in such a way that whatever superheating takes place, it, it takes place in a useful manner. Okay, uh, so all useless superheat should be avoided. So let us look at the effect of uh, useful superheat. Okay. So, this figure shows again just like subcooling uh, the cycle without and with superheating on T s as well as uh, P s diagrams. Okay. Look at the T s diagram as I said 1, 2, 3, 4 is without superheating. Okay. If you do not have any superheating what is the uh, your useful refrigeration effect? This is the useful refrigeration effect okay, this area. right? And what is the work of uh, compression? We have seen that the work of compression in fact is uh, this entire area. Okay. So, this is Q e and this is your work of compression uh, without superheating. Now, let us say that I have superheated it. Superheated means what I am doing? I am pushing this 
exit condition from the saturated vapor to a superheated vapor okay along the constant pressure line that means this is the uh, constant p line okay so it's a sensible heat transfer process uh, assuming that there are no pressure drops so it is taking place isobarically so this point is shifting to superheated region remember that you have subcooled region here two phase region here and superheated region here okay so because of this superheating 1 to 1 dash okay so 1 to 1 dash is your superheating so what is the effect of the superheating first effect immediately you see that there is an increase in uh, refrigeration effect and that increase is given by this area okay so this is the area which is an indication of increase in refrigeration effect because of superheating okay and there is also another effect what is that there is also a simultaneous increase in work of compression and that is given by this area okay so because of the superheating both refrigeration effect as well as the work of compression both are increasing okay the same thing can be seen from uh, this point also without superheating uh, from ph diagram without superheating this is your refrigeration effect with superheating this is your refrigeration effect so you can see that refrigeration effect has increased because of superheating and uh, without superheating this is your work of compression okay h2 minus h1 and with superheating this is the work of compression okay and uh, uh, this will be always greater than this one okay because you we shall see later that these lines the isentropes they diverge as you move into the superheated region okay you can see that they are diverging as a result h2 dash minus h1 dash will be greater than h2 minus h1 that is very evident from uh, this ts diagram okay so we have uh, one positive effect that is we are getting higher refrigeration effect and one negative effect that is uh, higher work input so ultimately whether it is good for the performance or not let us see that okay so let uh, first let me uh, summarize what i have discussed a useful superheating increases both refrigeration effect and work of compression it also increases you might have noticed that by pushing the suction condition into superheated zone the compressor discharge temperature also increases and uh, since temperature is increasing at the inlet to the compressor at the at a fixed pressure the specific volume of refrigerant also increases that means in addition to uh, refrigeration effect and work of compression superheat also affects the compressor discharge temperature as well as the specific volume of the refrigerant at compressor inlet okay these are the effects okay now whether uh, the COP and volumetric uh, refrigeration capacity or volumetric refrigeration effect increases or not depends upon the nature of the refrigerant and operating condition so you cannot say uh, off hand whether superheating will uh, improve the COP or not okay it's a very much a function of the nature of the refrigerant and also to some extent the operating conditions okay so you have to examine each refrigerant and decide uh, whether superheating increases COP or not okay we shall see that a little later whether it increases COP or not some amount of superheat is always used in practical systems to prevent entry of liquid into compressors so there is a very pra practical reason uh, why superheat is uh, necessary in actual systems because just like uh, an expansion device cannot tolerate vapor uh, a compressor we have seen in the last class cannot tolerate most of the compressors cannot tolerate the presence of liquid okay so you must make sure that whatever is entering into the compressor is vapor okay no liquid is entering into the compressor now if you have a cycle without superheating that means the entry condition is on the saturated vapor line okay and uh, due to some changes in the evaporator load it is quite possible that the entry condition can shift into the two phase region that means some liquid can enter into the compressor which may damage the compressor okay but if you are providing superheating even if there is some small change in the evaporator load still the exit condition will be in the vapor uh, region only so you are uh, ensuring a safe uh, operation of compressor okay so this is one of the um, uh, reasons why superheating is uh, provided in almost all systems uh, whether it increases cop or not and it's also seen that uh, from uh, practical observations and experimental uh, results that superheating has beneficial effects on volumetric uh, efficiency of the compressor so because of these two reasons uh, superheating is provided but how much superheating has to be given depends of again upon uh, upon the uh, nature of the refrigerant okay and as i have already mentioned useless superheat is detrimental okay so you must uh, always uh, avoid uh, uh, useless superheat that means you must avoid heat transfer between the refrigerant and the outside ambient 
okay, in the suction line. So, this is the reason why all the suction lines are insulated. That means, lines going from the evaporator to the compressor have got to be insulated so that heat transfer between the surrounding air and the refrigerant can be uh, minimized, thereby minimizing the useless superheating. Them, right. Now, let us look at the use of liquid suction heat exchanger. So, this is a modification over the simple cycle. Now, we have seen that uh, you can provide certain amount of uh, subcooling and uh, certain amount of superheating using the temperature difference available between the refrigerant and the heat source and sink. Okay. But there are certain restrictions as you have seen the, that is restricted by the available uh, heat source and sink temperatures and also on the additional area that you are providing. Okay. And if you want certain amount of uh, subcooling and superheating that is that may not be possible always just by exchanging heat with the heat source or sink. Okay. So, one way of ensuring uh, required amount of uh, subcooling and superheating is by using what is known as a liquid suction heat exchanger or LSHX. Okay. So, that is what is mentioned here required degree of subcooling and superheating may not be possible if one were to rely on heat transfer between the refrigerant and external source and sink. And also if refrigerant at the exit of the evaporator is not sufficiently superheated, this is another reason uh, why we need a liquid suction heat exchanger. If the exit is not sufficiently superheated, then it may get superheated by exchanging heat with the surroundings which as you know is useless superheating. So, a liquid suction heat exchanger can ensure required amount of subcooling and superheating. Let us see what is a liquid suction heat exchanger. Okay, a liquid suction heat exchanger is basically a counter flow heat exchanger in which the warm refrigerant liquid from the condenser exchanges heat with the cool refrigerant vapor from the evaporator. So, let me show this. Okay. So, what we have here is a system with a liquid suction heat exchanger. In the basic system, we had uh, only evaporator, compressor, condenser and expansion devices. So, in the modified system we have we have added an extra component liquid suction heat exchanger. So, what is happening in this extra component? In this extra component the liquid from the condenser, okay, liquid from the condenser is flowing in this direction okay, and vapor from the evaporator is flowing in this direction. That means, they are flowing in opposite directions. Okay. And I uh, will show you in the next uh, slide that the temperature of the liquid that is entering into the heat exchanger is much larger than the temperature of the vapor that is entering into the heat exchanger. As a result, this liquid can exchange heat with the uh, vapor. So, the liquid becomes cooler and the vapor becomes hotter. Okay. That means, uh, if you look at the temperatures T4 uh, that is the liquid outlet uh, temperature will be less than T3 and T1 will be greater than T6. That means, the liquid is getting subcooled and super uh, vapor is getting superheated. Okay. Uh, and as I have already mentioned process 6 to 1 is superheating of vapor and process 3 to 4 is subcooling of liquid. Let me show this one on uh, TS and PS diagrams. So, what you see here uh, on the top is the TS diagram and uh, the bottom you have PS diagram. If you do not have any uh, subcooling, uh, or superheating or if you do not have any liquid suction heat exchanger, this is the temperature of the liquid okay, and this is the temperature of the vapor. So, you can see that a large temperature difference exists between the liquid and the vapor. So, you can exchange actually heat between these two by using a liquid suction heat exchanger. That is what is happening here, that is what is shown here. Okay. So, this case, this is exchanging heat uh, like this, okay. this is the arrow, this is exchanging heat like this. In this process, this temperature is reducing and this temperature is increasing. And both the processes are typically almost isobaric. So, they take place, uh, this process subcooling takes place along the constant uh, condenser pressure uh, line and superheating is taking place along the constant uh, evaporator pressure line. Okay. The same thing is shown here also. So, you can see that this is your process of subcooling and this is the process of superheating. Okay. This is your superheating, this is delta T, okay. delta T superheat and this is your uh, subcooling. So, what is the effect of uh, subcooling and superheating uh, on the system performance? Immediately one thing is uh, clear that uh, refrigeration effect has increased. Okay. Without uh, this liquid suction heat exchanger, your refrigeration effect was this much. Okay. This is your delta H or that is equal to Q E. Okay. And because of this uh, sub liquid suction heat exchanger, now it has become this much. Okay. So, that is a benefit. But you will also simultaneously see that uh, there will be some increase in 
work of compression also because without subcooling this will be this would have been your work of compression and with uh, liquid suction heat exchanger this becomes your work of compression okay. So, both the effects are uh, present. Now, let, uh, let us uh, give, uh, write some basic equations for this. So, what is the heat transfer in the liquid suction heat exchanger? If you apply steady flow energy equation and neglect uh, potential and kinetic energy changes, then uh, heat transfer in the liquid suction heat exchanger is simply given by this heat transfer. This is the heat law energy lost by the refrigerant liquid and this is uh, that is equal to energy gained by the vapor okay. So, this is for the liquid portion and this is for the vapor portion and uh, since the mass flow rates are same, same mass is flowing through um, uh, both the components uh, uh, this can, can get cancelled. So, you can simply write this as H3 minus H4 is equal to H1 minus H6 where H3 is a saturated liquid enthalpy, H4 is the enthalpy at the end of the uh, liquid suction heat exchanger and H1 is a saturated uh, I am sorry H6 is the saturated uh, vapor enthalpy and H1 is the uh, uh, vapor enthalpy at the end of liquid suction heat exchanger. And if you are uh, taking some average uh, specific heat values, we can write this as Cpl into T3 minus T4 which is equal to Cpv into T1 minus T6, where Cpl is the specific heat of the liquid and Cpv is the specific heat of the vapor. And as you know generally the specific heat of the liquid is much higher than specific heat of the vapor that means Cpl will be greater than Cpv. So, from this equation T3 minus T4 should be less than T1 minus T6 that means delta T subcooling will be generally less than delta T superheating okay. How much uh, less depends upon the values of Cp, Cp for liquid and Cp for the vapor okay. So, that is what is mentioned here uh, degree of superheating is greater than degree of subcooling right. Now, if you define uh, the effectiveness of heat exchanger as the heat actual heat transfer divided by maximum possible heat transfer okay. That means, I am defining uh, an effectiveness for the heat exchanger uh, epsilon LSHX which is defined as the ratio of actual heat transfer to maximum possible heat transfer rate okay. What is actual heat transfer if you are writing it for the vapor this is nothing but the uh, m dot Cp into delta T of the vapor that is m dot R into Cpv into T1 minus T6 okay. And what is the maximum possible heat transfer? The maximum possible heat transfer in a typical heat exchanger uh, is uh, for a fluid which has a lower m dot Cp. That means, a fluid which has lower uh, uh, mass flow rate into specific heat will undergo the maximum possible temperature change. Okay. So, as a result uh, in uh, our case uh, the Cp of vapor is less than the Cp of liquid whereas the mass flow rates are same. So, vapor has the lower thermal capacity compared to the liquid. So, if at all anything is uh, undergoing the maximum temperature change it has to be the vapor okay. So, Q max is nothing but MCP of vapor into delta T max okay that is what is written here. So, you can see that this is the MCP of the vapor and this is the maximum possible temperature difference okay. What is the maximum possible temperature difference? When uh, the exit condition of the vapor is same as the inlet condition of the liquid that means, when T3 becomes T1 that is the condition under which you get maximum possible heat transfer okay. Again these two are get cancelled. So, you have uh, ultimately effectiveness is defined as T1 minus T6 by T3 minus T6 okay. So, you might have studied in heat, uh, heat transfer uh, this thing uh, how do you evaluate uh, uh, effectiveness in terms of other parameter design parameters. Now, if you take a hypothetical case where you have a perfect heat exchanger whose effectiveness is 1 okay. That means, this is equal to 1. If this is equal to 1 what happens? T1 will be same as T3 and what is T3? T3 is nothing but the condenser temperature. That means, by using a perfect uh, liquid suction heat exchanger you can uh, heat the refrigerant vapor uh, from the uh, evaporator temperature right up to the condenser temperature uh, isobarically okay. That means, when epsilon, epsilon LSHX is 1 T exit of the liquid suction heat exchanger will be same as the condenser temperature. This gives rise to an interesting cycle uh, proposed by Grindley and it is called as Grindley cycle. Let me quickly show the Grindley cycle. Okay. So, this is what is shown Grindley cycle is shown on T s diagram. So, what is happening here is this should have been a solid line. Okay. So, again as I said uh, we are using a liquid suction heat exchanger. So, heat is transferred from the uh, sub uh, subcooled liquid to the vapor and I am using uh, a, a perfect heat exchanger okay. So, when I am using a perfect heat exchanger 
the exit condition of the vapor will be same as the inlet condition of the liquid. That means T1 will be same as T3, that is what I have shown in the earlier slide. And what is T3? T3 is nothing but your Tc. Okay. So, I am able to heat the refrigerant vapor uh, from the evaporator temperature T right up to the condenser temperature T C. Okay. Then uh, what I have to do is still it is at the same pressure. Remember that it is still uh, taking place isobarically that means the process is uh, pr pressure is still evaporator pressure only. Next process as you know is the compression process. Okay. And what kind of a compression process here? This is an isothermal compression. Okay. 1 to 2 is isothermal compression because you have already attained the condenser temperature. Uh, so, you have to compress the liquid isothermally from 1 to 2. Previously, we had uh, isentropic compressor. So, by using uh, um, a per perfect uh, heat exchanger, you can have uh, this kind of a situation where the isentropic uh, compression is replaced by an isothermal compression. What is the advantage of isothermal compression? We shall see in the subsequent lectures that isothermal compress uh, compression will give rise to lower work, uh, work input. As a result, you get higher COPs. Okay, so this cycle is known as uh, Grindle cycle. That means a vapor compression cycle wherein the isentropic compression is replaced by an isothermal compression using a perfect liquid suction heat exchanger. It is called as Grindle cycle and what is the uh, advantage of Grindle cycle is it will give you better COP okay, compared to the standard cycle. Unfortunately, Grindle cycle is uh, difficult to build in practice. What are the difficulties? The difficulties are uh, mainly to do with uh, achieving isothermal compression, particularly having with uh, very high speed uh, compressors such as uh, centrifugal compressors or reciprocating compressors. Okay. So, uh, this uh, Grindle cycle could not be built in practice because of this problem. Okay. But uh, still there is some interest because using some other types of compressors such as screw type compressors, you can uh, approach isothermal compression. Okay. So, still there is some interest in this uh, cycle. Okay. So, this is uh, the summary of whatever I have uh, discussed just now. Uh, liquid suction heat exchanger is a counter flow heat exchanger in which the warm refrigerant liquid from the condenser exchanges heat with the cool refrigerant vapor from the evaporator. Thus, the liquid becomes subcooled and the vapor becomes superheated. A LSHX increases the refrigeration effect as you have seen already and ensures only liquid entry into expansion device and only vapor entry into compressor. Okay, so, it has the double benefit of ensuring proper operation of expansion device as well as the compressor. So, it is generally desirable. Okay. Now, let us look at one important uh, issue that is the effect of suction condition. I have uh, mentioned when we were discussing superheat that when you are increasing the um, superheat, okay, uh, you are increasing the refrigeration effect at the same time you are also increasing the work of compression. So, ultimately whether uh, it will increase COP or not I said uh, depends upon the uh, nature of the refrigerant. Okay. Now, let us see uh, how do we decide whether it is good or not depending upon the nature of the refrigerant. Okay. That means, ultimately we are trying to find out how the condition of the suction, suction means the inlet to the compressor affect the performance of the system. Okay. So, when refrigerant is superheated usefully either in the evaporator or uh, liquid suction heat exchanger, refrigerant effect increases as I have already discussed, work of compression increases, specific volume also increases. So, whether COP and volumic refrigeration effects increase or not depends on primarily on the nature of the refrigerant. Okay. And uh, there is a method by which you can uh, formulate a criteria. Okay. This criteria was suggested by Ewing's and Gosney has derived useful relations. So, let me call this as Ewing's Gosney criteria. And this criteria is used uh, to find whether superheating uh, is beneficial from uh, the point of COP or not. Okay. So, this criteria is used to uh, find this, just this. Okay. And uh, this criteria is uh, based on the assumption that the superheating is useful. Okay. So, if the uh, superheating is useless, then there is no point in applying this criteria okay, because it is anyway it is bad. Right? Okay. So, let us again come back to our uh, original uh, pH diagram. So, what you have here 1, 2, 3, 4 is the saturated cycle and uh, 1 dash 2 dash 3 4 is a superheated cycle. Let me begin with, uh, uh, let us begin the discussion, let, for the sake of argument, let us say that uh, this is your expansion process. As you know that the process 3 to 4 is expansion process 
and uh, if you are compressing the refrigerant right at this point, uh, what happens? Uh, okay, let us say that this is uh, uh, some uh, okay, so two double dash. Okay, so I am compressing the refrigerant vapor immediately after the expansion device. Uh, so, what will be the COP of the system? Obviously, you can see that the if you are uh, doing this, uh, QE will be zero because you are not getting any useful uh, refrigeration effect. Of course, W will not be zero, right? That means you are spending some uh, this thing, but you are not getting any benefit, uh, right? So, now what happens if this point is shifted? That means the point four is shifting. Okay, point four is shifting the, in this direction. Uh, okay, as you can see that as point four is uh, shifting in this uh, direction, uh, the refrigeration effect increases. Uh, Okay, that means uh, QE becomes non-zero. Okay, it is uh, becomes positive uh, non-zero. That means COP will be greater than zero. Okay, so gradually COP increases as you move from this point. Okay, so COP continues to increase as long as this exit condition lies inside of this. Okay, as long as this exit condition lies inside of this. Okay, now. Uh, you have uh, one condition okay that is the condition uh, this for all refrigerants uh, the COP increases between this point to this point okay such that the exit condition lies on the saturated vapor line. So, with further uh, increase in the uh, enthalpy of the exit condition whether COP increases or not depends upon the nature of the refrigerant that means if you are moving this point further right up to the vapor uh, the saturated vapor point and uh, right into the superheated region okay will the COP increase or not because you are seeing that this is increasing and this is also increasing. Okay. So, up to this point the increase in uh, this is greater than the increase in this. So, COP definitely increases, but uh, from this point onward whether this COP increases or not we do not know at this moment. Okay. So, this is what is given by your uh, Ewing's and Gosni criteria. They have, uh, they have shown that uh, the COP will be maximum inside the two phase region if this criteria is satisfied. Okay. So, maximum COP occurs when suction state is inside two phase region if COP sat is greater than uh, T e by T 2 sat minus T. Okay. That means, if this condition is satisfied uh, you will have maximum uh, COP uh, inside the two phase region and any superheating uh, will reduce the COP. Okay. And what is COP sat here? COP sat is the uh, COP of a saturation cycle 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. And what is T2 sat? T2 sat as you can see here is nothing but the compressor exit temperature when the compressor inlet is on the saturated vapor line. Okay. So, what we have to do simply is take the saturated uh, cycle, find out the COP of the saturated cycle for any given refrigerant from the enthalpy values. Okay. Then find out uh, the exit uh, compressor exit temperature T2 sat and then uh, find out this uh, value. Okay. And if you find that this is greater than this maximum occurs inside and superheating is bad for from COP point of view. Okay. Let me show this with an example. Right. So, this table here it is taken from Gosni and uh, this compares uh, uh, these two parameters that is uh, COP fat, okay, COP fat and this expression okay, uh, for different refrigerants and this data is uh, obtained at minus 15 degree centigrade that is 258 uh, Kelvin and 30 degrees condenser temperature, okay, minus 15 degree centigrade evaporator temperature and 30 degrees condenser temperature. Okay. For example, if you look at uh, ammonia, the uh, COP of the saturated cycle is 4.77 and the exit temperature is 372 that is 99 degree centigrade, centigrade and you find that this uh, value T by T 2 sat minus T e is 2.26 that means this is greater than this. Okay. So, uh, according to um, uh, Gosni's criteria the maximum COP occurs inside the uh, two phase region. Okay. And for whereas, for carbon dioxide you can say see that this is smaller than this. So, there is no maximum. Similarly, for R 11 this is greater than this. So, there is a maximum right. Like that you can see the um, values for different refrigerants. And from this uh, uh, you can uh, summarize that for refrigerants uh, ammonia R11 and R22 superheating reduces COP and for carbon dioxide R12 and R502 superheating increases COP. Okay. So, it depends very much on the uh, superheat. Okay. So, so, this is what is mentioned here. Uh, uh, this I have already discussed whether superheating improves COP or not. We have to use uh, superheat to ensure only refrigerant vapor entry into compressor and improve volumic, uh, volumetric efficiency of compressor and uh, to prevent moisture condensation on suction lines in domestic refrigerators etcetera. 
Now let us look at actual vapor compression of strain cycle and what way they are different from the theoretical cycles. What are we have been discussing from now about, till now are theoretical cycles which do not have or which did not have any internal reversibilities. Okay. Now let us look at uh, an actual cycle. What way an actual system differs from this theoretical uh, cycle? Okay. So they, uh, the differences are like this. You have pressure drops in evaporator, condenser, and uh, liquid suction heat exchanger and you have pressure drop across suction and discharge valves of the compressor and friction and heat transfer in compressor and pressure drop and heat transfer in connecting pipelines and the presence of foreign matter. Okay, so let me quickly show the uh, actual cycle. You can see that uh, because of all these pressure drops, heat transfer and all the shape which was uh, like a parallelogram has uh, got twisted. Okay. Initially with, without any pressure drop this should have been a horizontal line but because of the pressure drop it has become inclined. Similarly in the condenser because of the pressure drop you have an inclined line instead of a uh, horizontal line this. Like this there are various uh, pressure drops, heat transfers and all, all are listed here. Okay. And uh, we, we shall see that the effect of all these pressure drops and heat transfers is ultimately to uh, affect the performance of the system. Okay. The same thing is shown on uh, TS diagram here. Well, okay. Now effect of pressure drop and heat transfer, well, let me uh, discuss qualitatively. Pressure drop and heat transfer in the vapor line affects the performance significantly by reducing uh, system capacity and COP that means uh, the vapor line design is very critical and you have to make sure that pressure drop is as small as possible. And normally pressure drop leading to a saturation temperature of 1 to 2 Kelvin in evaporator and 1 Kelvin in suction line is considered to be acceptable. That means there are some standards you have to design the evaporator in such a way that your delta P corresponds to at a temperature drop of 1 to 2 degrees in evaporator and 1 degree in suction line. Now pressure drop in evaporator and suction line depends on a layout and type of the refrigerant tubing, velocity of refrigerant and type of refrigerant. And pressure drop can be reduced by reducing refrigerant velocity. However, minimum velocity of 4 to 6 meters is required in evaporator and suction lines for proper carrier of uh, lubricating oil to the compressor. That means you have to maintain certain minimum velocity, okay. even though reduction in velocity um, reduces the pressure drop. We also see that pressure drop and heat transfer in liquid line is not very critical and pressure drop across the valves of the compressor can be quite considerable and they may affect the performance adversely. Okay. And heat transfer from the compressor is deliberately provided in most of the cases so as to operate the compressor within safe temperature limits. So in the theoretical cycle we assume that the compression process is reversible and adiabatic that means there is no heat transfer. Okay. But in actual systems some heat transfer is provided deliberately near the compressor because we would not we do not want to have very high temperatures in the compressor. Okay. Generally the compressors are cooled. Okay. That means the compression process is no longer isentropic but it is polytropic and generally we define uh, uh, what is known as an isentropic efficiency to find the uh, compare the efficiency of actual compressor with the ideal compressor. Okay. Then uh, apart from this you can also have uh, presence of foreign matter such as lubricating oil, non-condensable gases such as air and water. Okay. And uh, you can also have particulate matter if you are not, uh, if your system is not clean in the beginning and all these things will affect the performance of the actual systems. And the presence of lubricating oil cannot be avoided but the presence of other things like air, water and particulate matter has to be minimized through proper design and maintenance. Now COP of actual systems can be given by the simple expression which is a multiplication of efficiency of the cycle, efficiency of the compressor, efficiency of the motor into COP of a Kano cycle. Okay. This is a very rough uh, for a very rough estimation okay. and empirical equations have been uh, developed to estimate the efficiency of the cycle, efficiency of the motor, uh, compressor, etc. Okay. Using these uh, equations you can get a rough idea of the actual COP compared to the Kano COP. Now a complete vapor compression refrigerant system in addition to the basic components consists of several other accessories. We will discuss this later. They are uh, controls and safety devices such as overload protectors, high and low pressure cutouts, oil separators, etc. And temperature and flow controls and filters, dryers, valves, etc. Okay. So actual system will have a lot many components um, over and above the basic components. Okay. So let me quickly summarize what we have learned in this lesson. In this lesson we have looked at the performance of SSS cycle. And we have uh, discussed the modifications by means of subcooling and superheating and we have also discussed liquid suction heat exchanger. And uh, we have seen the criteria for uh, superheat uh, beneficial effect of superheat. 
And we have also seen the effect of uh, pressure drops or uh, the actual systems with pressure drops and heat transfer rates, etc. Okay. So, in the next lesson, we will continue the vapor component efficient systems and we will discuss multi stage and cascade uh, cycles which are used in uh, very large temperature lift applications. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, in the last two lectures, we discussed single stage vapor compression refrigeration systems. In this lecture, I shall introduce multi stage vapor compression refrigeration systems. So, the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to introduce or uh, discuss limitations of single stage cycles, introduce the concepts of flash gas removal and intercooling, discuss various multi stage multi compression systems with flash gas removal and intercoolers and present a steady state analysis of a typical multi stage system. And at the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain with the T s and P s diagrams the limitations of single stage cycles, describe concepts of flash gas removal and intercooling and their benefits and analyze typical multi stage multi compression systems for ammonia and halocarbons using steady state mass and energy balances. We have seen that single stage systems are adequate as long as the temperature difference between the evaporator and condenser is small. This difference is normally known as temperature lift that means the temperature difference between the condenser and evaporator is known as temperature lift and as long as the temperature lift is small single stage systems are adequate. But there are many applications where the temperature lift can be quite high and the temperature lift can be large either due to the requirement of very low evaporator temperatures and or due to very high condensing temperature. That means, there are many applications where uh, for a given uh, condensing temperature you require very low evaporator temperatures. This will increase the temperature lift. There are other applications where the evaporator temperature is not so low, but the required condensing temperature is very high. This also increases the temperature lift. So, for these temperature lift applications uh, single stage system we shall see uh, now that uh, they have uh, many limitations. Okay. Uh, for example, on the low temperature side. Uh, let me give some examples where we can encounter very low evaporator temperatures. Uh, for example, in uh, frozen food industries, uh, the required temperatures can be as low as minus 40 degree centigrade or lower. Typically, you have to freeze food products and if you are uh, talking about quick freezing or so, you, you require very, very low temperatures of the order of minus 40 or minus 50. Another very uh, typical application where you require very low temperature are in the chemical industries. Uh, where really very low temperatures uh, as low as minus 150 degree centigrade or even lower are required for liquefaction of gases. So, these are the two typical applications where you encounter very low evaporator temperatures. And on the high side, if you are using uh, the refrigerant system as a heat pump for heating applications, then the required condensing temperature can be very high. The typical applications of uh, refrigerant system in the form of heat pump could be for example, in process heating or in the drying. So, these are two typical examples where uh, the temperature lift is uh, very high. And uh, in fact, in the last class uh, we have seen that as the temperature lift increases, single stage systems become inefficient. Let me repeat this with the help of uh, T s and P s diagrams. For example, here uh, on a T s diagram, we have shown the effect of evaporator temperature. Here uh, condenser temperature is uh, fixed, this is a condenser temperature which is fixed.